what's happening in Pakistan. The military has been bringing the government, moving the governments. We had ever seen or heard of an event in which 4,400 houses were raided in one night. This is the first time the Lahore High Court, Islamabad High Court, Peshawar High Court is releasing someone and there at the doorsteps, the police comes up and in total rebuke and shut up call to the High Court, the police again arrested. The Pakistani establishment has identified Imran Khan as the enemy. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. I am thankful to, um, to all of you, to Dr. Munir, to Dr. Khizar, um, Sadia, to Dr. Kiran, and Dr. Tarek, and to all organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'm also very happy that this is a university setting. Unfortunately, I think that the students are not back till 28th of August. And I was very eager to see more students, but I think that the university setting actually sends a sort of a message, which is very important. Um, the theme that has been given to me uh, by Dr. Munir and the organizers uh, of this panel is that why the democracy repeatedly fails in Pakistan. Um, I had also promised Dr. Munir, in fact, I asserted that, you know, I would not take uh, my 10 minutes can become 12 minutes, but it would not become 15 minutes. So I would present a few bullet points as assertions rather than as explanations of why I'm saying what I'm saying. And I look forward to the question answer session. I see there's a lot of experience uh, in this room, um, hundreds of years of experience. Everyone has reached a point from somewhere. And I think we'll be able to, all the panelists will be able to bring depth and gravitas to our discussion. Our goal over here is to find solutions, not to condemn. Um, and I would, the points I'm going to say right now, I would, um, I would try to expand upon them when you raise the questions. So we, uh, we think in terms of the questions. Um, a few words to explain um, who I am and why I would like to make these assertions and why I think that I have a certain kind of um, confidence in making these assertions. I am a television journalist. I also I have also written extensively. I've been writing for the past 20 years, and I have been published in almost all Pakistani major newspapers and international publications. I've been a columnist with the uh, Alish Times. I've written for Al Jazeera. Um, but I have been sort of a living historian of Pakistan in the sense that since 2005, when I started television, this is almost 18 years, and I moved from, and that was in London. I moved to Pakistan in 2007. From 2005 till this time period, before I became, I had to run from Pakistan, I became a proclaimed offender and terrorist. I have been uh, conducting at least four programs a week, at times five programs a week. And at times, you know, during the elections and during this crisis, I've been conducting programs, television programs, seven days a week but not programs, special broadcasts that could continue for eight to 10 hours. So what's the significance of this is that I have, um, I enjoyed tremendous excess and interaction uh, with all class of Pakistani decision makers, the political, political party leaders from all political parties, whether they were top political leadership, they were second tier political leadership, third degree political leadership, city leadership. Similarly, I enjoyed an unfettered, unfettered access to the core of diplomats, whether it's Pakistan Foreign Office or the US Embassy, or the British High Commission, the Indian High Commission, very important in terms of understanding the issues in Pakistan. Um, and I had access with the, uh, not only with the Prime Minister's Office and Chief Minister's Office, I also had access to the top of the military decision makers, the top of the intelligence. And on the basis of this, I can make certain kind of assertions. Um, when I look at many writings in the last six months, um, from Pakistani major English publications, also on the Twitter, um, from people from parts of think tanks uh, and universities. Um, the impression is created as if what's happening in Pakistan um, is a routine affair, or there's nothing unusual about it, and this has been happening before. 
I mean, military has been bringing the governments and military has been removing the governments. Uh, I mean, what if the Imran Khan government has been removed the way it has been removed? Nawaz government was also removed. Benazir Bhutto was also assassinated. And these things have been happening in Pakistani history. So it's just a usual, normal routine of the Pakistani history. I would assert that the present crisis in Pakistan of whose manifestation, the crisis manifestation, which we started to see from somewhere in the March, but let's say the government was, uh, was removed on 9th April 2022, so 16 months. This is not the usual crisis of Pakistan. This is not something that has been happening in Pakistan. This is something very new. This is something very unusual. For instance, is while Dr. Muniz was choked when he was reminding you of some of the events that have happened in the last 16 months. In the last, um, barring the exception of the former East Pakistan and Bangladesh, even including the tragic events of 1977-79, Pakistani authorities have never raided thousands of homes. They have not broken the doors and the gates. I mean, forget about what happened after 9th May. People have forgotten that on 24th of May 2022, when Imran Khan had announced his long march from Lahore, according to the, according to the given figures of the Punjab police, 4,400 houses and farmhouses in Punjab alone were raided in the middle of the night. Not on 25th May, but 24th May. When people refer to 25th May 2022, they actually forget that since the party, the People's Party, the Hari and Saf had actually announced a long march from, uh, from KP and Punjab towards Islamabad in order to fail that long march, not to confront it on the roads, but to fail it as a preventive measure in one of the most unusual events in the history of Pakistan. Well, I, such events had taken place uh, in former East Pakistan. We don't really have a good recollection of it but not in the entire 75 years of the history of West Pakistan, which is now Pakistan. We had ever seen or heard of an event in which 4,400 houses were raided in one night across Punjab, and people were arrested, humiliated. I mean, these included ex-judges like Nasara uh, Iqbal. People were arrested. Uh, the children were beaten. The women were insulted and humiliated, you know. So much so that, you know, there were instances when women had their phones in their hands and they were saying that stop. The doors were broken in the middle of the night after 2 a.m. They had their mobile phones in their hand and they said, I'm going to record you, stop. And the phones were snatched. This kind of brutality, this kind of insult, this kind of humiliation of the woman in Pakistan has never been seen before. This is also the time period which has seen an unprecedented political mobilization of the women of Pakistan. In the 75 years, the entire history of the state of Pakistan, we have never seen this political participation of young, middle-aged and older women in the politics of Pakistan. Women in Pakistani politics were only from maybe few political families and their friends who used to be part of the political process or poor visible. The women were to be seen, not heard in this country. But now you see how many hundreds of women were arrested after 9th May. So, People's minds are focused on, on 9th May, but this is not started by 9th May or 12th May 2023. This process of the reign of terror and the brutality was unleashed from 24th of May 2022. You must actually remember this thing. This is the first point. Then breaking doors and homes, arresting men, stripping them naked, in front of their family, I mean, the way I think Dr. Shahbaz Gill, I haven't seen him. Where is he? Or oh, he's not, a, he will probably arrive later, right? You know, the way in August 2022, Dr. Shahbaz Gill was abducted illegally, stripped naked, electrocuted, kept in jail for 45 days. I mean, one example. What happened to Senator Azam Sawati? The way his videos were made and sent to his family and his wife, I mean, to show the power of the state. Um, Jamil Farooqi, a television anchor of a mainstream television anchor, was just simply arrested from his outside his office, stripped 
hung upside down, stripped naked. Director news of ARY Ahmad Yusuf was his home and gates were broken after midnight, 2 a.m. in the night, arrested in front of his daughters, stripped naked, hung upside down, stripped naked, you know, for the whole night. This is not the Pakistan, you know. Yes, they, I agree. These selective events might have happened during Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's Dalai camps, but with few people, maybe with two dozen people. These events must have happened and happened with, say, a few hundred people between 1977-79 time period, General Ziaul Haq's uh, martial law, especially when he was executing Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto and people came out in protest. But these did not define the norm and culture of the Pakistani exercise of authority. Yes, now, it is another thing which needs to be understood from the perspective and lens of the political science. It happens in the periphery of a state. Pakistani state has identified first, unfortunately, East Pakistan as its periphery. They didn't, they were not prepared to take them in the mainstream. They thought they were free to unleash a reign of terror in the former East Pakistan and its villages. And the West Pakistan never fully understood what was happening over there. Then after the 70s, they unleashed similar waves of terror in, uh, uh, in Baluchistan. And of course, they did, they and the MQM together did, played havoc in Karachi as well. But this time, the crisis dimension is this, the two areas that always identified that state has some sort of responsibility to protect itself and national security in the Punjab of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, they have really unleashed this reign of terror. Now, it's not only a moral dimensional question. This also identifies the extent of the crisis that there is a state authority that was trying to control the periphery in the name of national security, but has lost control to the extent that it has unleashed the terror outside, outside itself. It has exercised the same kind of terror tactics within its own ambit, where it thought it had the moral authority. In the process, it has lost all moral authorities. So this is where the crisis is. Now, let me wind it up because I said I will. Um, so, why it is different? The, the three or four points, the kind of polarization between the left and the right, the kind of polarization between PTI and PMLN or PPP, the kind of polarization between the PTI and the establishment that is being seen right now is a totally new phenomenon. This kind of sharp divide in polarization has not been seen before. The second thing is, uh, yes, um, this is also a point to be understood. The way the process of law and constitution has been totally undermined, the courts, the high courts, the right of habeas corpus, which is in fact a common law right from 12th century, perhaps that where people have to be released when a court says produce the body. This is the first time this did not even happen in 1977-79. The Lahore High Court, Islamabad High Court, Peshawar High Court is releasing someone and there at the doorsteps, the police comes up and in total rebuke and shut up call to the High Court, the police again arrest the people. The way the Supreme Court of Pakistan has been made dysfunctional. There was a time when Supreme Court could send Imran Khan government packing in April of 2022. Look what happened to Supreme Court as a result of its own political misjudgment. So, the way law and constitution have been eroded is also a totally new phenomena. Now, the erosion of the law and constitution can have its resonance within the 1977-79 time period. But some of the older generation politicians who are now septuagenarians in the 70s, but were young members of Pakistan People's Party, have told me, more than two or three of them, that the difference in 1977-79 was when after the PNA movement, the martial law was declared, people accepted that martial law has been declared. Martial law was sort of welcomed by a large section of PNA supporters. And the PPP leadership also realized that the martial law has declared. They went to the deputy martial law administrators and by and large, they submitted. There wasn't any resistance from People's Party. The resistance happened from the workers when it became obvious that Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto is being hanged or might be hanged, and then you hear of those, you know, lashes and the brutality that was unleashed. So, the, in terms of brutality and constitutional or legal violation, it, this resembles 1977-79, but not at this scale, because here it wasn't a martial law. Had a martial law been declared on 9th and 10th April, 
then the people might have accepted the martial law. But people thought it's not a martial law. People thought it's 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 a it's a, uh, it's, a it's a military determined government. So they resisted it, and they came on coming up more and more hard. So this is one difference. But the more the more frightening difference is. So whereas there's one resemblance is with the martial law of 77, 79, the other resemblance is with the ethnic division of 1970, 69, 1971 time period, the way this ongoing uh, polarization is polarizing Punjab and KP. Right now, no one has said it openly, but as a political scientist and a keen student of Pakistani history, we need to see how the Federation of Pakistan is being undermined as a, as a result of this thing. What is happening right now? So why it is really happening? One important dimension you see, the Pakistani uh, 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 establishment has identified Imran Khan as the enemy. The thing that somehow or the other, if they manage to control Imran Khan, manage to bottle him up, or maybe force him to surrender, or they eliminate him, as of, of course an attempt was made to eliminate him on 3rd November 2022. That was not a, that was not a joke. I mean, he could have died, right? And many of you doctors, um, his doctor, I think, Fessel, and I showed me a diagram and he made it that how his femoral artery was missed by just two centimeters. So if his femoral artery had blown off, there would have not been any possibility of applying a tourniquet in Bazirabad and he would have died. So, I mean, of course, it, it, he could have died. So the establishment identifies Imran Khan responsible for all the challenges and the problems they face. But it's actually not Imran Khan. Imran Khan has become the agent and the symbol of this change. The change has to do with two or three factors. Pakistan's demographic change, the census says it is 241 million. We never know it's 241 million or it's 250 million. But the population has grown. The second factor is the young in this population are almost 65% or maybe 68% of them are under 35 years of age. Second factor. The third factor is this, there is a unprecedented income inequality. This kind of income inequality was not, uh, you know, you really need an economist to understand that. But the Pakistan of 1950s to 1990s onward didn't have this kind of income inequality. People might have looked poor, they were not short of the caloric value. They were not short of the ability to feed themselves. They were still eating properly. They had the proper protein and whatever. So the massive income inequality is another factor. Um, they don't have meaningful jobs. This huge young youth force doesn't have meaningful job that can occupy their minds, that can give them a sense of reason, an identity to life, a sense of definition of what the life means for them. That is another problem. Establishment's old utility of 1960s, first against the Soviet Union, then in Afghanistan, wars has ended. Now, establishment's utility appears for the West to be able to tame and control Pakistani population, to subdue them, to submit to an Indian design on the region so that India can actually stand up and can face up to the rise of China. Because according to the best political scientists, the only real way of containing the rise of China is actually letting India develop and become as big as a regional power uh, as China is. And without Pakistan being a cooperative framework to, to the Indian economy or to the Indian system, this is not going to happen. This is also a factor. So India's rise is very important. End of a step to till I last word. Um, West rising fear of China, China's presentation of the Belt Road Initiative and its component as CPEC is also an important factor. Then the China-India conflict of June 2020 unnerved India and India's supporter, where India complained to its supporters that it has been locked into a two-front situation with two nuclear states, China on one side and Pakistan on the other side. All these factors in my analysis has made Pakistani establishment extremely insecure about its own future. It, has to, it is trying to redefine itself, find a utility and a purpose of its existence, which in the political science is called as a Ghizan de Thor. And that is why the panic is such that they not only have controlled all Pakistani expression within Pakistan, they're trying to suppress all Pakistani expression in North America, diasporas, us sitting over here. So I will take your questions whenever I get the opportunity. Thank you so much.